Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 397, featuring the third, and uh, at least for now, final installment of my interview with the great Leonard Boyarski. This part of the interview, uh, we talk about uh, Arcanum, we talk about Vampire Masquerade Bloodlines, a little bit more about Fallout, uh, we talk about Diablo 3, <laughs> Temple of Elemental Evil, and there's even a special surprise in here for you. So uh, there's a lot of great stuff in this uh, segment, so without further ado, here is Mr. Leonard Boyarski. Well, we got uh, Arcanum, right? This uh, a great cult classic game. You know, I <laughs> I got just about as many questions about that as I, I did the Fallout, but we'll just uh, I just wanted to hear about the uh, maybe just kind of a general question about how that compared making that game compared to to making Fallout. Um, it was a lot more difficult. Um, we made the weird decision that we were going to make it with. Uh, as few people as possible um, for budgetary reasons, but also because we're like, we didn't have a lot of producers. We didn't have a lot of management on, on fallout. Um, we had a lot of, there was like, I was managing artists and Tim was managing programmers and there was a lot of that going on, but we're like, we can make it with a lot less people. If we just get a bunch of leads, a bunch of people who really know what they're doing and we all just make the same game and just kind of run and go for it. Um, which ended up working but it also meant, you know, we were making a game that's the size of like, you know, Baldur's Gate, which I think had 100 plus people on it with literally 12 people with an intern and uh, and 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 another uh, writer, Jason's Jason's fiance at the time, um, helped us out with some of the writing um, and some of the movie stuff, I think. But at the end of the day, you know, looking back on that, that was just a I don't know what we were thinking. Um, so I ended up spending, you know, at the end of the game, we were seven days a week, you know, uh, 12, 14, 17, 20 hour days. Um, it was just really, uh, really much more trying than, uh, fallout was, uh, fallout had a lot of really lucky breaks that we didn't have on Arcanum. Um, I think at the end of the day, we are proud that we shipped it. It was in many ways, very close to what we envisioned, but you know, obviously, we weren't able to test it adequately. Uh, I feel like it needed a couple more iterations, um, so it didn't get the breaks that Fallout had. And I think part of that was that we were spending, you know, much of our time running the business, doing a lot of things that we didn't have to do on Fallout. Um, you know, we had we paid no, like I said, we we thought like, oh, we'll just get a bunch of people who are really good at what they do, don't need any management. And then, you know, even if you don't necessarily need producers or specific management, you still need to run your company. You still need to be people who are like concerned with your employees' welfare. And we always tried to do it. We did very good for our employees. You know, we we always made sure that like even when we closed, we had enough money to pay everybody's, um, you know, unpaid vacation or paid vacation. Uh, we even gave a couple people bonuses at the end right before we closed. So we we're very proud of how we ran it. But at the same time, we didn't put a lot of thought into the fact that like, even if it had worked out and, and people didn't need any management whatsoever, you still need to build a company. You still need to do all that stuff that, you know, that you have to do to have a successful company. And we were just weren't interested in that. We wanted to make games this, you know, but we figured, and this is part going back to the question of how difficult it was to leave. We figured that was our best shot to make a game. Once again, showing our, our naivete, that was the best way to make another game that was just purely our vision was to go off and make our own company which in hindsight is another ridiculous thing to assume. It seems to be a fairly common conundrum in the games industry. I've had quite a few developers on, and they, they start off making games and having so much fun with that, but then they'll get promoted into some type of management uh, position, and then they're like on the business side, and then they lose a lot of the uh, their momentum or passion that way. You know, this, Would you say something like that happened to you? I think so. Um it just really, you know, having the um, support, um, even when you don't need it, like even though we are fairly self-contained on Fallout, you know, when they needed to, when we needed a whole bunch of extra people to finish the game, we had them. Uh, we needed extra resources. Like I said, we, you know, we, we get the extra resources. 
Um, you have people doing stuff behind the scenes. You have HR people. You have all this stuff that goes on and, you know, that running the company. And we didn't have to do any of that at, at Fallout, uh, at Interplay on Fallout. We just concentrated on making Fallout. And, you know, all of a sudden, uh, I guess the best way to to illustrate it is that on Fallout, I mean, I, I feel like I was a good art director. I feel like I was a good art lead in working with artists. But at the same time, me and Jason were very, very adamant about this is what the game is going to be. And if you didn't agree or you didn't really fit into our team, we had no problem with going like, OK, see you later, because they would just go into another team at Interplay. If we did that to somebody at our can on Arcanum or at, at uh, Troika, we had to fire them. And then also, you know, me and Tim and Jason are now the faces of the company. I can't go in and be a complete hard ass constantly because I'm also the guy who's like, yes, this is my company. You're working for my company. You're working for me. At Interplay, they weren't working for me. They were just on my team. Um, so you immediately start going, oh, am I being too, you know, draconian about some of these decisions? Um, and it didn't feel that way on Fallout because everybody was kind of on board to make the game. Um, but as you get bigger teams, as, you, as the stuff progresses, you have to deal with different personality types. Once again, going back to the fact that Fallout seems to have this weird luck, you know, once again, I, I mean, I made a fun of it in my talk that I cranked my luck up to, to heroic levels, <laughs> but I feel like Fallout had heroic level luck. You know, yeah. every time something seems to have gone wrong, oh, we're going to dump GURPS. We can't use GURPS anymore. Well, literally, like I think a month or two before that happened, me and Tim were having a conversation about how the game was going. And Tim was like, you know, this game's going to be really good. It's going to be an awesome GURPS game, but it's going to be niche because really seriously, it would be much better as a game if it wasn't GURPS because there's all these obscure things we were doing and we were doing great. But it was just like even I working on the game didn't understand how some of the some of the rules were working in our game. Um, so, you know, lo and behold, a month or two later, Steve Jackson, you know, creates this situation where we have to dump GURPS. Um, you know, I'm making a, a, an end sequence where I'm like, you know, I don't know how to make an end sequence where it's all happy and you have balloons and and it's a party. And then me and Jason came up with the idea of like, well, you know, they probably would kick you out of the vault. You know, things like that just happened all along the path of Fallout, um, you know, and making our own company and making Arcanum and Temple and Vampire. We didn't have those breaks. You know, it was just not um, we we're just not rolling the <laughs> rolling the dice well enough at those at that point. Well, let's get in a little bit into Vampire Masquerade Bloodlines. And sure. I would say that's in the. You know, like Arcanum is a huge cult following for these games. I mean, people recognize there's some issues with it, but they, they still love it. And it's kind of like the, you know, you think about what maybe what could have been, you know, with more time, more more budget or whatever. I had a question from Thamer about it. He, he was asking what was going on between Valve and Troika uh, during that development. And you talked a little bit in the talk about how it you had some problems to, with the, not just with Valve, right, but there was some uh, larger issues and coming out at the same time half-life 2 there was just a lot of sort of uh contractual stuff i guess uh, uh business <laughs> yeah you know a lot more going on than just the game development there right well we didn't personally have problems with valve um per se i mean valve was great valve got us the contract we wouldn't have had that contract if it wasn't for the engine but the engine wasn't finished um and that was no secret to anybody um anybody who makes games can tell you the first rule of making games is you don't use a third part, an unfinished third party engine, which is exactly what we were doing. And we knew going into it, that was going to be a problem. I don't believe either us or valve, I mean, us or Activision knew exactly how unfinished the engine was because they were also always already showing demos, um, showing they had this big presentation at E3 about all the stuff their engine could do. So when we started working with it, we're like, oh, there's there's not much here. Um, and as time went on, Activision would get upset because we weren't being able to deliver anything. And we're just like, we can't. We don't have the engine, you know. And one of the things that um, Half-Life and Half-Life 2 were known for was was really pretty good AI at the time, if, if I recall correctly. And they kept changing how the AI worked in the engine. Um, at one point, even... I hope this is an NDA at one point, even like letting their AI guy go and throwing out all of their AI and starting over. And this was when we were supposedly like three quarters of the way through the development of the game. So at that point, we just said to, to Activision, OK, if we're going to finish this game, we have to start. We have to keep what they have and just develop our own AI from there. Um, 
and which was not something that we wanted to do, not something that we thought we could do better than Valve, but Activision was just like, and rightfully so, you guys have to finish this game. And we're just like, okay, this is this is the only way we do it. So Activision would get very upset with us about things that we had no control over, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and Valve is Valve. So like, I don't know if Activision ever called up Valve and yelled at them <laughs> like they yelled at us, but... You were taking sure, the brunt of this. I'm sure if they called Valve and 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 had the heated conversations that they, like they had with us, Valve would have been like, "Yeah, okay, whatever. We'll talk to you guys later." Whereas we were just like, "Oh my God, this is our livelihood. This is everything is riding on this game." So, like I said, we never had any problems with Valve. I mean, they were really good to work with. They got us the contract. Um, they weren't necessarily set up to have people working with their engine because they were still making their game with this engine that they were changing all the time. Um, but you know, they did whatever they could for us when we went to them with questions or when we had problems with the engine, it was just like our main problem with the engine was that it wasn't finished and valve was doing what valve does. They were going to take their time and make the game that they had to make, or they were going to make because that's how valve and companies like them and blizzard work. They're going to take the time to do it, but we're a small developer on a very specific contract with a big publisher caught in the middle of that whole thing. Yeah, that just sounds completely hellish to me, trying to make a game with an engine that's unfinished and <laughs> constantly up being updated and you don't you don't ever know what's not a fun you never time. know what you're gonna see the next day, right? Yeah, and also, you know, we were trying to make a game that was completely different than what they were yeah. using. There you know, um Half Life Two um does a very good job of hiding the fact that you're running down corridors the whole time because you're running around a city, but when you look at it and when you really pull it apart, it's like, no, you're still just running down corridors. They just presented it in a lot better way. Um, but we wanted more of an open world game and, you know, that we had to break the game up in weird ways to get that to work because their engine was optimized to work for their game um, and not to work for any game you wanted to make with it. Um, so it was, you know, yeah, it was, it was a very difficult situation. Um, I put on... 40 pounds, I think. I was not happy. I was very depressed. Um, as much as I was sad that Interplay, uh, Interplay, I was very sad that Troika uh, didn't continue after that. Looking back on it, I think I probably would have literally died had it continued the way wow. it was going. I was, not, I was not in a good space emotionally. I was not in a good space um, for my health. Um, it was just really um, exhausting uh, we kept crunching to try to make deadlines when, when the engine wasn't ready, but we'd try to get something together that was proving that we were still moving forward um, and not, and we didn't want to do, um, you know, a lot of times when you do demos, I'm sure this is a big industry secret, a lot of time when you do demos that you're showing at E3 or showing to the press, it's some of it's faked. Some of it's like, okay, we know that this will work for this one instance, but it's not going to expand for the whole game. We didn't want to do that for deliverables we were sending to our publisher because that's dishonest. That's not something that we want to, um, we didn't want to put in the extra work. We wanted to build stuff that was going to be in the game. So we were always trying to deliver things, showing that we were moving forward. And we kept, I mean, there's no other way to put it. We kept failing time and time again to actually deliver the stuff because the engine just wasn't in a place where we could do it. And then, of course, we made the decision to finish our version of the engine and you know, uh, the game just didn't have enough testing. It didn't have enough time. Um, by the time the game actually started to look like a game, it was like, okay, you guys are in alpha, finish this thing up, you're done. And, you know, as much as I cried on the phone to them and complained and yelled and said, this is ridiculous. We finally see what this game is. We could make a great game. Like, you know, give us a couple extra months. Um, they said, no, you know, this is when you're going to ship it. I wish they would have held it for at least a couple weeks, but at the end of the day, um, I can't fault them for being like, you know, we gave you another, we gave you way more time than we originally um, planned for. And, you know, you guys got to give us a finished game. So that's, that's the way the business works. Um, and that's what we, and we shipped what we shipped. And uh, there's parts of it that I think are very great. And there's parts of it that are just horrific. And I, you know, I'm glad it's, it's fantastic that people have been, um, you know, modding the thing for 10 years. Um, I, I love that people found that in it because, you know, uh, the only thing worse than, than going through what we went through would have been if we went out and nobody found any value in it whatsoever. Um, I know a lot of people didn't find value in it, but there was a core group of people who think who thought it was this great thing and have continued to be dedicated to it, which is, uh, 
I wouldn't necessarily say, say uh, that it made it all worthwhile, um, but it takes some of the sting off of it at, at least. Well, yeah, I got, I get, I hear about it all the time from people that watch this show. They really love it, and it's one of the most heavily requested. Hey, when are you going to cover it? Come on, cover it already. That's that's fantastic. I I, I like that. Uh, you know, obviously, once again, being behind the scenes and knowing what went on. Um, I recently, I couldn't bring myself to play it. It's like, it still has all these just really bad feelings and memories for me. Um, but I actually watched some YouTube videos of people doing playthroughs of it. Um, and one of the funniest things that happened was this guy, you know, this guy was doing the playthrough was running through a specific area in the game. And I was just like, like, you know, having these flashbacks of like running through this area. It's like, I'm like, God, that looks so unfinished. Oh. This is so, this is so crappy looking. This is Oh, this is horrible! And right at right at that moment, the guy's like, "I just love this game. This is the best game ever. Like, look at all this stuff you can do." And he's talking about how great it was. And I'm like, "Oh, that's that's kind of cathartic to to as right at the moment, I'm like bemoaning to myself how horrible parts of it were. This guy was coming back and saying, "No, this is this fantastic thing." Um, but I still haven't been able to play it <laughs> ever since. I have not actually played Vampire since we shipped it. Which is I've done I've played Fallout I've played Arcanum uh, I you know but I've never gone back and, and played Vampire. That's a perfect example of that idea of the artist being his own worst critic, right? <laughs> well, you know everything that you wanted to do and right. and you see, I'd say out of all the games I've made uh, to date, um, and part of it I'm sure was just you know the 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 thrill of being a beginner and doing it the first time, but but Fallout. Um, was you know the game that was what we wanted it to be i mean there obviously there was bugs obviously there was stuff we would have done better but when we shipped that game and it went out the door there wasn't the like god i wish we could have done this better or this wasn't the game we wanted to make um which you know there's there's a part of that in every game i've shipped since then it's just part of the business and part of it was probably just our naive um arrogance at the time of like going this is the best thing ever and people are going to love this um so Regardless of what it was, um, you know, that's just been the 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 game that when we shipped it, we thought it was what we wanted it to be for the most part. I just uh, one last thing about Troika, your Troika years. You know, it sounds like it was uh, really rough going there at the end, but you know, just looking back over the whole the whole thing, is there you know, maybe one decision or one thing you would have really liked to go back and change, do differently, or is it? Uh, can you isolate that or is it just a bunch of bunch of factors? I would say that the biggest uh, mistake we made was that we had, and I think it shows, um, all of our um, writing and story guys that had experience um, were on Vampire. And we did not pay enough attention because we split up. Tim was running Temple and me and Jason were running Vampire. And um, Tim and 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 Tom were were doing a lot of the writing on on Temple, and it was fine. It's just that it really needed a pass of um, of of that me and a J or Jason or Chad Moore, one of our other main writers, could have brought to it. And I feel like if we had had if we had worked on Temple as more of a group, like we worked on Arcanum, um, I think it would have had that. Um, spark that it, it was missing. And, you know, as, as we've seen with, um, you know, some of the other games that are based on, on Dungeons and Dragons, that's, you know, people are just really interested in Dungeons and Dragons games. I don't know if it would have sold any better because, you know, one of the things we did there was that uh, we wanted it to be a really, really hardcore Dungeons and Dragons game, which is great if you're a hardcore Dungeons and Dragons player. Um, but I don't know if we have crossed over to the mainstream, but I feel like it probably would have been, um, better accepted at the time i think it would have had more appeal because we were known for deep story and like you know writing and that stuff and i and i or, or things along that line and I, I just don't feel like um temple had that that kind of feeling i think the gameplay was great i think uh you know a lot of people love that game still and, and i'm i'm happy we made that game i'm proud of everything we did at troika um but i feel like we could have put more focus on those aspects of it um, sadly, um, you know, because we were so enmeshed in vampire at the time, we did not have the bandwidth for us to do that. We couldn't have possibly done that. So I don't know if I look back on it going, I wish I'd made a different decision because there was no other decision to make. We had to make vampire. We were making temple. 
we made the decision we had to make at the time. I just wish we could have spent more time on the story side of Temple. Well, now we've, we've covered an awful lot of stuff here. Really appreciate it. I just wanted to see what we could do about uh, Diablo 3. Uh, one of the things that struck me was this game. It's another one of those games with the sort of infamous development cycle, right, and, and how long yeah. it took to come out and all these expectations. I mean, you must have had some trepidations going into this. Uh, ironically, no. No. Um, because what they hired me to, to do um, and what I pitched was uh, – bringing some more RPG elements to Diablo. Um, you know, they had obviously the skill trees and all that stuff, but they didn't do branching stories. They didn't do, uh, you know, in-depth uh, writing on the stories. It was, it was, uh, it was a writing at a, a, writing on a certain level uh, versus, you know, kind of what we tried to do in our games. And looking back on it, I don't think that was probably the right approach. We, we ended up abandoning that approach um, I wasn't obviously being the RPG guy. I'm I'm a little biased, but the people who are you know uh, Chris Metzen, Jay Wilson, uh, the creative director of the company, and the guy running the team thought what I was pitching was a good idea. But um, Chris Metzen, the the creative director at Blizzard, and Jay Wilson, the game director, also thought that was a good idea, and that's why they hired me after I made this pitch. Um, it turned out not to be a good direction for the game. In hindsight, I'm not quite sure why I thought it would be a good direction for the game, probably because I'm the RPG guy. I want to make RPGs. Um, but uh, I was always, perhaps because I knew, you know, we knew people who were working on Diablo. We knew people who worked on Diablo 2. We knew people who worked at Blizzard that whole time because, you know, Interplay and uh, Blizzard um, had a, had a, 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 a close uh, relationship. As a matter of fact, the first... CES I went to, I was demoing Blackthorn, um, which was a one of the last Blizzard games that uh, Interplay, <coughs> excuse me, published. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you can't go into a game, whether it's a Diablo 3 uh, or any other established uh, franchise, and uh, be fearful about what you're doing. You have to go in there and make the game that you want to make. And make the game that you think is going to be a great game and not i mean you want to take into account what fans want but you can't um be hesitant to do things because you're concerned about how they'll be received if that makes if that makes any sense it sounded like in your in your talk you were saying that, that, you know that game was a, as action rpg real fast-paced sort of thing and you had this more oh i was i was talking yeah. about um you can't oh i know what i was saying so you can't, uh, when you're making a game, whether, you know, it's the next game in a sequence or a series, of po especially a popular series, you can't go into it with, um, you know, like this, this nervousness or this like, oh, my God, what are the fans going to think? Obviously, you need to, um, you know, give the fans what they want to a certain degree, but you also have to make something that's coming from your heart that you're really passionate about. And if you spend all your time second guessing what you're doing it's gonna gonna show, and I feel like there was some of that um, in the process. Um, I didn't show up with that, and I don't think I ever had that. I think I was always trying to make this game, but I think there was some of that, and uh, rightfully so. I mean, I'm, I've never been in charge of a company that's selling games that you know at the quantities that uh, Blizzard does. Um, so I could, you know, if I was in charge of that and not the guy working on it, I might have had a little bit of trepidation about, you know, what we were gonna do. Um, but you know, and perhaps it's be, like I said, it's like, we started out, we knew a lot of guys working at Blizzard. Um, it was much more of a, um, it was much more of a, um, you know, we weren't quite still in the garage at that point. We were like, you know, uh, small companies at that point just becoming big companies. Um, so it all still seemed very, even though this was after wow and Diablo had been such a huge thing, oh, yeah. it still felt like. I don't know. I just just because we've known these people for a long time, like a lot of the people or not a lot of the people, but a couple of the people I went to uh, work with at Blizzard had worked at Interplay. Um, so it always still felt like kind of this. Uh, uh, we were still the guys who were, um, you know, making those games, you know, that, that, that didn't have this big cultural impact. that weren't these gigantic things. We were still, um, you know, just these scrappy guys who were like, hey, like, we're going to make these games. Hey, Tim. I just said scrappy. Oh, <laughs> that's the sound of me. 
I summoned ah, Tim by saying strap Tim. him. Grab, hey, Matt. grab a chair, man. Do you have any questions for, for Tim? I was in the you know, I got about a billion questions for him. <laughs> <laughs> we already did Okay, this. you can't answer any of them, though, right? Is it, what, what can you tell me about? You got to give me some something on this, this um, top well, secret well, project. I mean, everybody's excited. Well, what we've talked about so far and what we've mm-hmm. announced so far that we can talk about <laughs> is that, uh, you know, Tim called me and begged me to come over here and help him make this game. Uh, no, we, we we had been talking periodically throughout the years. You know, me and Tim and Jason have remained friends. And uh, we always talked about how great it would be uh, to make another game, to make another IP from scratch. And uh, the timing was right. And uh, Obsidian wanted Tim to make this, and he reached out to me. And so, you know, I just was really fired up to come back and make another hardcore RPG uh, alongside Tim. I mean, we just, we just have a really good working relationship. Um, I'm good at certain things that he's not good at and vice versa. Uh, so it just works out really good. Um, I hope you don't mind. I, I told him what I would have done differently is to, <laughs> to, is to put more of our, oh, yeah. our uh, core writing staff onto Temple. Um, ah, <laughs> I admit that. I can, I, can, I can tell you what I'm terrible at. Writing, it seems to be one of them. Though he wrote War Never Changes, so you know he's got that. To, well, to, that's to, the iconic that's line, honest, yeah. On his tombstone is like war, war never changes. That was my Tim one. Kane. That was my one thing, and then apparently I was yeah. tapped out after that. Well, that's the one thing. Wow. Yeah. Well, so we, did you tell him our humor combines? That's. Oh uh, no, we humor. haven't. We haven't talked about that. Go, why don't you pick, that's our so, secret sauce. Is yeah. um, when Leonard tends to be dark, morose humor, <laughs> and I tend to be a little over the top silly humor. So what we do is we combine, and a lot of the stuff you see in Fallout, that kind of humor. Is it that's where we intersect? You know, is this kind of like dark, funny stuff? In fact, we just had an AI meeting, which I would tell you about. Sorry, <laughs> which you guys can't hear about. Just pretend like I'm not here, guys. Just just continue. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not no me. One's watching. <laughs> so I mean, everybody was laughing because I said, "Hey, we need. I need something from you guys," and I explained what it was, and everyone's laughing. Oh, I need to go. No, I want. I got to hear this. <laughs> Well, anyway, yeah, I, I guess we can assume, though, uh, this new project, it'll not be the tradition. It seems like this is your reputation, right? You don't do the traditional fantasy stuff. You know, there's always something unique about it. There's some new new spin, something you don't see coming. I mean, can we assume that much? Uh, I would say so. I mean, I think people <laughs> can, you know, I mean, if you look at the stuff we've done in the past, of, you know, that we've created uh, 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 from scratch, I think, you know, we just have a very weird way of doing things and i think to me um and that's you know that's where arcanum came from we're like well we feel like we're doing a fantasy game and i'm just like yeah i don't want to do a straight fantasy game we got to do something different um and that's where we came up with the idea of the industrial revolution in a fantasy world um it just never interested me to do the standard stuff you know i always want to put a weird twist on things which is probably maybe one of the reasons some of my ideas didn't go over well when we were working on Diablo 3, because I'm like, let's not do Diablo 3. Let's do this game that's totally different. Um, but yeah, I think it's, 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 a, it's a curse and a, and a perk. <laughs> it's, it's a curse well, and a blessing, I guess. His, these good ideas are going into this new game. Yes. We're not saying no. <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to it. I know everybody else is, too. But anyway, I know you, you guys are busy, so uh, thank you very much, Leonard, for taking all this time. And it's great no seeing problem. you, Tim. Good seeing you too, Matt. All right, well, thanks for asking me to do this. It was a lot of fun. Oh, likewise. Uh, you guys have a great day. You too. <laughs> right. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a uh, little interview with the developer of Dice or the <laughs> developers of Dice Sword, a uh, RPG platform hybrid, a little something different, and that'll be followed by an interview with Steve Ince of Revolution. Uh, he did a lot of the uh, writing on the graphical adventure games uh, back in the uh, Amiga days, uh, Beneath the Still Sky. Uh, later, he got into the Broken Sword series. Uh, I think it'll be really great. Really looking forward to uh, chatting with him. And, of course, there's lots more stuff uh, on down the pipe, so uh, stay tuned. I know <laughs> it's going to be an exciting year here at uh, Mad Chat. Anyway, I want to thank you very, 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 very much for your support of this show. Remember, I couldn't do this without your support. You're keeping these episodes coming. If you like my interview with Leonard, 
uh, why not just uh, chip in a couple of bucks over there at the Patreon site? Let's go to the show notes, and you'll be supporting the show, keeping all the, you know, there's no advertisements here, nothing like that. Uh, it's just, you know, fun, hopefully informative chats uh, with great people. So uh, thank you for making that happen. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? so Adam posted this. It's a, a really nice write-up about a man named Ed Smith. It's called Ed Smith and the Imagination Machine, the untold story of a black video game pioneer. This is a long read by Binge, is that Binge? Bingey? Edwards. And it's all about the APF and the Imagination Machine. It's kind of a hybrid video game console uh, slash PC. Uh, anyway, it's a really interesting read. Uh, you don't hear a lot about APF or the Imagination Machine uh, or Ed Smith. So if you're looking for a bit of history, it's, it's a really well-written piece. Uh, go check that out. It's uh, over. I'll, I have a link in the show notes to it. Uh, not really sure what the name of that uh, magazine is, but uh, you can read it for free online. Just look for the link in the show notes. And then uh, Stig wrote in with this. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, Id Software co-founders confirm that its biggest game heroes are all related. Uh, so it, as it turns out, B.J. Uh, Blaskowitz, Commander Keen, Doom guy, and the <laughs> Doom guy uh, are, could all go to the same family reunion. Uh, the Wolfenstein hero is Commander Keen's grandfather, while Keen is Doom guy's dad. <laughs> so I guess that mystery has uh, been laid to rest now. Uh, anyway, some fun stuff. Uh, and then lastly, I want to tell you about this uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance. Uh, this looks like a really great RPG. It's uh, historically accurate, so they, they're not going the magical uh, fantasy route. Instead, this is uh, set in, the, in Bohemia in 1403. Painstakingly recreates period-specific details from armor and swords to the layout of the towns. You know, <laughs> it sounds a lot like Darklands uh, to me. Uh, you play a Henry, who is the son of a blacksmith, Thrust into a raging civil war, you watch helplessly as invaders storm your village and slaughter your friends and family. Narrowly escaping the attack, you grab your sword to fight back. Uh, so that looks good. It sounds good. Uh, there's a nice write-up about it. Should be out on GOG by uh, February 27th, so not too far off. I think it's going to be released sooner than that on Steam, but uh, remember you can uh, buy it on GOG and support Match Chat at no extra cost, uh, so please do that instead. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I got uh, another one from Lagunitis. Lagunitis. Uh, it's called uh, the Old Gnarly Wine. <laughs> a fun little dog here on the bottle. Uh, this is a barley wine style ale, I'm assuming. Uh, <laughs> there is a thing called gnarly wine. Uh, the first sip is for thirst. The second one for pleasure. The third sip is for knowing. And the fourth for pure. Madness. <laughs> That's a great write-up. Oh, let's see. Mondo Ultra Mega Super Premium Barley Wine Ale is, like, is a little like having a kid. Uh, the first part is fun and messy. <laughs> takes a while to ferment and then a whole lot longer to mature. It is expensive and takes up a lot of space. Ah, this one we age in tanks for over a month. Why not buy three? <laughs> uh, cheers. And these guys are out of uh, California, uh, Petaluma, and, oh, and also Chicago, uh, Chicago, Illinois. So you might be able to get a hold of this wherever you're from. Uh, let's see if they say anything else. It's a limited release. Uh, IBU 69.39. Well, that's pretty, uh, pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty specific there. Uh, let's see if they mention the, uh, is the other hand. OG is 1.096, and alcohol by volume is 10.9%. Uh, so that's about standard, I'd say, for barley wine. Uh, anyway, I'm really excited about this one, so uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this old gnarly wine style ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. And I've been smelling it. It's, it's a very pleasant aroma. It's, a, it's a, a little bit of a citrusy zest in there. Uh, but mostly you're just kind of smelling, I guess that's just sort of a... I just cannot quite put my uh, <laughs> finger on what this smells like. 
It doesn't smell like most of the barley wines I've had, though. It's kind of a... I guess you'd say more kind of a bourbon-y like aroma to this. A little bit like a... Maybe a little bit of a cinnamon-like quality to it. It's just kind of hard to pin down, but it really does smell nice. It's a very... I guess you could say it's a complex aroma. <laughs> there you go. Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh, this one's a, a very powerful flavor. It's a little bit of, on the bitter side there. Uh, you get kind of that chocolatey cherry taste. Uh, the aftertaste is uh, kind of mild, a little bit of a, uh, maybe like a little bit of a coffee flavor there towards the end. Uh, definitely a lot going on. And it, again, doesn't taste uh, like the standard barley wines either. Uh, let me try this again. Yeah, this one, <laughs> it's definitely got a bit of a kick to it. It's that strong, sweet, sort of chocolatey. It almost is kind of like a, a bourbon. It's, it's not very uh, barley winey, uh, at least not uh, like the bar other barley wines I've tried. Uh, usually those seem to be a little bit less bitter. I'll try it again here. Yeah, so this one, you know, it's tasty, but it's very... Uh, it is rather bitter. It's got a strong taste. You definitely taste the other. <laughs> you definitely know there's some uh, high alcohol uh, in this one. It's, uh, you know, I wouldn't rush out and buy like three of these, but uh, I guess if you want something different, if you kind of like that sort of darker, uh, chocolatey, coffee-like taste, well, I'll just go ahead and give this one more, one more taste here. Yeah, just I cannot say that that is something that I would uh, want to drink a whole lot of, just because I don't really not a big fan of a really bitter uh, ale. But uh, it's it's not that bad, and you definitely get some uh, sweet uh, flavors in there. The aroma is nice, but uh, I think I'm gonna go maybe three out of five on this, sort of between a two and a three out of five. Uh, your mileage may vary on this, as a lot of this, of course, just depends on what you like to drink. Uh, but just for me, I would probably go maybe two, I'll just go ahead and say uh, three out of five. Um, I don't hate it by any means, but it's just not something I would especially want to uh, go out and drink a ton of. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right, uh, let's wrap this up with a quote. And I was uh, looking for quotes uh, by Bram Stoker, because we did talk about vampires in this episode. He's one of my favorite writers. Uh, anyway, here's a little bit. I think this is uh, probably from the, uh, the book. Anyway, it goes something like this. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. We'll ponder on that and see you guys next week. Children of the night, what music they make.